the first time someone came up with jam was when I was at home having beers with a friend and we were just talking about this problem of naming it and he was saying, but it's really like a new stack. Static is just not the right word. And we started talking about what can we call it? The main concept for the jam stack is that the stack has moved up a level. Essentially three really big evolutions have taken place over the last five years. We saw early on these really interesting projects coming out of these modern build tools. Before that, it was very much about FTPing into a server, changing some stuff and hoping things went well. Hey, this is Brian, and you're listening to Jamstack Radio, a bi-weekly series where we discuss the Jamstack, a new way of building websites and apps that are fast, secure, and simple to work with. Jamstack Radio is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. So welcome to episode two of Jamstack Radio. Today you've got me, and you've also got a special guest in studio, which is Matthias Billman. Matthias, you want to say hello? Hi there. Happy to be here. Cool. So uh, my main reason for having you here is because this is called Jamstack Radio, and you coined the term Jamstack. Do you want to talk a little more about that and where it came from? Yeah, sure. So if I really remember right, I was maybe not even me that actually coined the term. It sort of came out organically because we've been doing uh, Netlify for quite a while now. And before that, I was doing BitBalloon. And since the beginning of that, we were in this space of sort of modern static websites. And that's a really bad description of what we're doing, right? And we kept having that problem that talking to people about static sites, they would think about like something very static, right? They would think about like a brochure or something with no moving parts or a little one pager or something like that. And what we were seeing was that, and and the whole reason we started to, to, to build this product was we saw people building something much more interesting, but with an approach where you really separated the back end from the front end and separated the build stage from the hosting stage, took advantage of of modern content delivery networks and all these things. And all the things that we sort of admired that made us build this and, and that were really cool projects were not things that anybody would think about if you mentioned static to them. Like they were like highly dynamic web applications, they were single page apps, or they were big content driven sites that just used content APIs instead of a traditional monolithic dynamic CMS. So we kept running into the problem of how to actually talk about those projects with a word that actually meant something and had a relation to what people were building. And we started talking to a lot of people like the people at Carrot, that like Carrot is an agency in New York that's part of Vice Media and that built the static site generator called Roots and pretty much all, almost all their projects is built with this flow. And none of these projects are, are things where people will go through the project and say, oh, that's a static website, right? Like all of their projects have, have dynamic parts and they are like have content teams behind them and so on. And the same with the same with the people at, at Instrument that also were early adopters and that have been doing this for, for way longer than, than Netlify has been around, like and have built sites for, for really exciting companies where, where it's again like they built the built tool called Middleman. And many of their sites are like huge developer heavy projects with hundreds of thousands of lines of Ruby and so on to, to produce things. But it's built with this approach where the back end is really separated from the front end. And again, like it, they also continuously ran into the issue that, that talking about that as, as static sites made, made no sense to anybody, right? Yeah. Um, so the more we talked to people, the more we could see that there was a need for some way of talking about this new stack that, that all these agencies were building with and that also talking to like Tom Preston Werner, who is also an investor in Netlify and, and was like the founder of GitHub, the inventor of Jekyll and GitHub Pages. He he was again one like the same, like what's like static is just not the right word. And we just with anybody we talked to about that, anybody in this space, we, we started talking about what can we call it? Like we need some better way of talking about what we are all doing, like what what can we call it? And we had a bunch of different variations of different phrases and none of them really seemed to work. And I think the first time someone came up with, with jam was probably just 
when I was at home having beers with a friend called uh, Andreas that that works at Uber now. Um, and we were just talking about this problem of naming it and, and he was saying, but it's really like a new stack, right? Like it, before it was like the lamb stack, you should have like a name for that. Like what about, and he thought of it and then he said jam. And I think, I can't remember what it stood for when he said it, like, but it was not actually what... Oh, like, it wasn't JavaScript? It wasn't like, it was something else, right? But he came up with that, with that word and then randomly I thought like, those letters, they could be like JavaScript APIs and markup. That's actually pretty covering for like, yeah. that's, that's actually what people are building. In. So it was a bit of name driven development. So, in a certain way, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. we, 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 we weren't really sure is that the best way to call it. And then we just started talking with, with some of all these people like, that we had already been discussing over and over with, like, what do we call this? And I said, like, how about Jamstack for JavaScript APIs and markup? And, and they always like, yeah, that works. <laughs> that works. Cool. And, and then, then we just started internally to, to, to use that phrase about, about it. And now we are just seeing that that at least it solves the issue of like how do we talk about this? How how do we yeah how do we call this way of of building sites that's really based around JavaScript API and markup? Yeah, and that's like decouples the the backend from the front end and typically you works with modern front end build tools, modern front end frameworks, and and so on. Yeah. So to circle back a bit, do you want to introduce what you do? Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, so I'm one of the founders of Netlify. Yeah. Uh, and Netlify is a platform for deploying Jamstack sites and apps, essentially, right? And we 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 saw early on these really interesting projects coming out of these modern built tools and projects like Middleman Roots being used to build really exciting sites with. But we also saw that that the people building projects with that had like all these different tools and services that they needed to put together in a very ad hoc form for each and every project. They needed to set up like some form of continuous deployment, they needed some kind of object store, they needed some CDN integration, and then they needed to deal with, with cache invalidation. And for some projects, people would easily like run into to, to deal breakers that would make them essentially do something really on ideal, like in the end, just still building a site statically, but in the end, hosting it on a single Nginx server somewhere just to be able to do things like proxy some requests somewhere else or do yep. uh, redirects or do GOIP based lookups and so on. Um, and we just saw that there was this big need for like if if this Jamstack approach to building sites should be really a viable workflow, there was a huge need for some kind of unifying platform that said like you don't need to go to five different places and hook everything up manually for each and every project. You can just go in, pick your Git repository and say like deploy this. Yeah. And that's Netlify. Some people might be and I I've only been in the industry for a couple of years, so I don't remember the like I remember the time before Git. Yeah. Um only because I, I tinkered. I was more of a tinkerer back yeah. then. Uh but not everybody really understands the scope of what it was like no. to deploy a website and like have no. somebody that knew all that that internal knowledge to do that. Do you want to explain like how Jamstack is different and how the approach is different compared to? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one of the really important things that like that I, I keep seeing it as essentially three really big evolutions have taken place over something like the last five years. Where again, if we go back five years ago, it was really the most normal workflow for front end developer was to FTP into a production server and change code there, right? And and anybody that's worked in like I mean I've asked that question at a couple of conferences and so on how many of you were doing that five years ago and it's everybody, right? They were, it just resonates so much with fuel. And it's something you sort of look back back at and think, oh my God, what was <laughs> what were we all doing? <laughs> but but that was how things worked. And version control was was something that you pretty much had on on larger development projects. But not on a normal website or a normal web. Like web apps were barely around, right? But but normal websites, they, they definitely didn't use version control, and that really changed radically with with Git and especially GitHub, but because Git came out of like very geeky kernel user groups, and then the people around GitHub, what they managed to do was really to popularize it and make it something that every developer could figure out how to use and, and turn it into way more than just a version control system, but also like the main collaboration tool for developers and and eventually also the way we think about doing deploys and just in general pushing code somewhere. And now I think like there's 18 million users on GitHub alone, right? And and it's just become 
completely mainstream that if you're a developer, you you work with Git. Otherwise, you're probably not a very good developer. Yeah. Um, and the second thing that that happened very much related and in the same period was this emergence of of modern build tools. So on the one hand, all the node-based build tools like Gulp and Grunt and Brunch and so on. When they first came out, it was really like every week there was a new one and no one was settling on anything. But but it was a huge change also, right? Because first of all, it, it allowed us to do all these kind of cross compilations of, of CSS and JavaScript, which meant that suddenly front end developers could start. Like today, if you're working on, on any modern project, you'll probably be using Babel and probably something like post CSS and essentially get access to JavaScript features and CSS features from the future. Yeah. Where before that you were so tied to what the browsers actually included, right? That whenever there was a new JavaScript feature coming out in one browser, it was like, oh that looks really exciting. Maybe in five, ten years we can actually start using it. But today it's moving much faster and that's in part because of all these built tools. And it meant that front-end developers suddenly started to incorporate the idea of a build tool and a compilation process in their workflow, where again, before that, it was very much about like FTPing into a server, changing some stuff and uh, hoping things went well, right? But these build tools changes a lot the process of how front-end developers works by having that constant compilation phase that suddenly can also include test frameworks and all kinds of things. And it meant that the step in a certain way from building your all your front end code that way to just building out the whole website that way became very small like suddenly it, it makes a lot of sense in saying if we're already compiling these things like why not also just compile all the html pages and make sure that we have the content that preferably in our github repository maybe in some api but that when we press compile we also instead of pushing it to to a server into a database that then has to Built the site every time someone visits it. Why not just have this this compilation setup we're already using all, every time we touch CSS and JavaScript? Why not just also have that build out all the sites, uh, all the all the pages of HTML in our site? Because once we do that, we can take it and we can push it to a content delivery network, and we can get performance of our site to be an order of magnitude faster, often 10 times faster, often way more. And um, we eliminate all of the security issues that such a big deal for, for WordPress and Drupal and Joomla and even Rails and Node applications, right? Like even it, older you, versions of IE. Yeah, precisely. And 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 a lot of the management hurdles of, of saying like, if you push something live and it's powered by like something like WordPress or something like Rails, you need to be on top of it all the time. Because if there is at some point a new zero day vulnerability in in one of the plugins you're using or something like that. You need to be on top of it enough to to notice that and to roll out a fix and to make sure that that fix doesn't break your app because often when you update a plugin suddenly you go in this jack shaving where it depends on other libraries. You need to update those and then you need to update your whole Rails version or WordPress version and suddenly you spend like days or hours just going for an update that for you have no value, right? It just keeps your site exactly the same as it was before, but it's necessary to avoid getting hacked by automated scripts and so on. And once you decouple this, once you just say, during the compilation step, I'm just going to build out all my HTML sites, pages, and, and push them to a CDN, then that problem goes away. You no longer have to stay on top of your site in the same way because the final site doesn't have these moving parts. And that was sort of the, the second big, so the first big thing was like the emergence of Git, the second really big, big thing was the emergence of all the modern front-end build tools and compilation as a part of a front-end developer's workflow. And then the third thing was sort of this emergence of the API economy where that's based on several different things, right? But one thing is just that if you look today at anything like adding comments to a website or integrating a help desk into your web app, getting live chat on on live support chat on a site or so many of these things, adding live search to a site, even just adding search to a site, right? All of those things used to be things that meant that if you wanted to do any of that, the only real way to do it was to have a big monolithic web app connected to a database that would interact with with the requests every time you visited. It was just like there was no other way now because browsers have become so much more powerful, it's way more feasible to just have small parts of the page 
talk to some external API and 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 give you those kind of functionalities. And that has meant that there's this whole economy of these kind of services that's emerged where you can easily add, like today, even most WordPress installs use Discuss for comments because it's just more convenient than having the comments go to your big WordPress install and go into the database. And the same, like if, if you were to add a social Twitter feed, like there's a time where you would have written that server side and had your server talk to Twitter and so on. Today, it's just the most natural thing that you'll just plug in a bit of JavaScript and you'll have your Twitter feed appear and, and it's the way to do it, right? Yeah, which is huge because, so you mentioned like the, the second part being the modern build tools and how mm. that's been changing, but yeah. the, the fact that JavaScript has been even more of a strong player in the web, yeah. Yeah. I think in the, the advent of Node coming onto the scene as yeah. well, yeah. really set the stage for all these build tools to start yeah. happening and yeah. people Absolutely. starting to do a lot more interesting things on the yeah. web for sure. Yeah. It's it's been pushing the web a lot, right? And then these are like the three main like improvements that happened, right? Like the the emergence of Git, the modern build tools, and and the whole API economy. And then on the other side, then on the other hand, there's been a a bunch of sort of pressures that that meant that people also had to are, are now really needing to change to this way of building sites because otherwise, the end result is just not good enough, right? So one big Pressure has been the with with the emergence of mobile performance have become even more important than than it was before, and has become really something where if your site is not performant enough, bounce rates will suffer a lot and people will go away, and in a certain way that has also become an excuse for some of the big corporate entities like Google and Facebook and so on to to introduce sort of alternatives to the web that are not as open based on saying, so we can see from Facebook that when people go to a website, it's too slow, so that means that more people simply get lost. So instead of using websites, you should use Facebook instant articles and then sort of sell your soul to to, to Facebook, do everything within our UI, but it'll be faster. And Google is doing something similar with AMP, saying like you should sort of build this whole completely different thing in parallel to your website that gets hosted on Google's infrastructure and gets indexed better and so on, and happens to also be controlled by Google in a way. The only way to sort of counteract that is to make sure that the web itself gets faster, right? And that, that we just deliver better performance by default. And then the other huge issue is that that malware have become like a hundred billion dollar industry and, and you have all these automated bot attacks that will exploit anything you have out there that's not updated, right? Like the one of the really famous examples was the Drupal Copolips, right? Where they where they pushed out a, a security notice uh, for for Drupal seven saying like that this is an exploit in the wild. Uh, we've already seen automated scripts using it to crawl any Drupal site and anyone who's running Drupal and that hasn't updated the Drupal install within seven hours of our initial in- announcement should consider their sites compromised and their servers hacked completely. Right? And then that's like how many out there are even capable of applying an update within seven hours of, of it being announced, right? It's it's huge. And Netcraft, I think, is, estimates that around 70% of all current WordPress sites are vulnerable to known exploits, typically because of some plugin they use or whatever, right? But it's just, it's it's become such a big deal that, that it's become really hard to run a site like that without actually at some point getting defaced or compromised or having a script injected that starts infecting your visitors' browsers, which is like really not the kind of advertisement you want to make. And those kind of pressures, also the, just the pressure in terms of general levels of traffic, of course, being larger and larger as the adoption of the internet grows also means that now if you have a dynamic site and you're not super sharp about caching it and suddenly it goes viral on, on Facebook or something like that, the amount of traffic you get will just kill it, right? So it will just go down exactly when you need it, unless you really over-provision wildly and, and then it becomes expensive and hard to manage. And again, these are sort of the pressures that also means that we have to start thinking differently about how we architecture our sites to be able to make sure that the, that the web is performant enough, that it's reliable enough, and that it's secure enough. Yeah, so with this whole... Jamstack approach. You mentioned a term earlier about separation. 
Yeah. And having the separation between yeah. your your front end yeah. and then your back end. Yeah. Uh, do you find that that's overall a more of a trend? I know yeah. f- frameworks like Django and Rails they're still around they're and still it makes it, it makes sense for certain people. But what do you what do you what's your opinion on where the the web's going? I, I think it's definitely going towards more more separation between the back end and the front end. Also, so you can reuse the back end for different kinds of clients, right? Like often now, the front end is not is no longer the only client speaking to your API. You might also have a mobile app that speaks to your API, or you might might have a CLI tool or a desktop app or whatever, right? But also because the whole concept of microservices has also really is obviously like super hyped right now and and it's a and buzzword at the as, moment as with everything right like there's always some trade offs and of course monolithic apps made something simpler that can be harder when when you have a more fragmented kind of infrastructure but at the same time i i think people are doing it because it makes a lot of sense in in terms also of how can you easily i mean in in Development in general, just the idea of decoupling elements have always been one of the f- basic building blocks of how do we create abstractions that's easier to think about. When we can really take components apart and have them very isolated from each other, it typically gets easier to work on those components because we don't have to understand the whole system just to work on one component. And I think that's a bit of the same trend now. Like If you can simply take the front end and make it easier for someone to work completely in isolation on your front end and you know that the person working on the front end is not going to break your servers or accidentally create a performance issue that makes your infrastructure blow up and so on because you can't, right? Like because you're, you're working on an isolated component that's your front end and you have someone else working on a specific API or even the same person working on a specific API but just sort of changing mindset and say, okay, now I'm going to work on the API for doing orders in my catalog and charge with Stripe, right? Then you have like a very isolated piece again that that's, you've made sure is pretty self-contained and does one thing and does it well and is easy to reason about and can be maybe used in other contexts as well. And I think that way of architecting applications can be really powerful. I also still think it's early days for it, right? I think there's a huge ecosystem still to be built around it. I think we as, we we have now like a ton of these API services that are typically proprietary but very easy to use and you can like plug in comments, you can plug in Facebook feeds, you can plug in something like Snipcard and say okay, I now I have a, a shopping cart and so on. But I think there's also room for for kind of an open source ecosystem. Of these kind of, of of very small targeted APIs that you can use with with this kind of Jamstack approach, and I think that's that's going to be one of the things that's going to be really exciting to to see evolve. Yeah. So as far as these tools, um, you mentioned static, and I know that you maintain the static web tech uh, or not web generators. Um, yes, yeah, static static Staticgen.com, yeah. yeah. So it's like a list of all these different tools to yeah. get up and running. Yeah. Uh, do you want to explain? That and how many how many actual tools do you have on there? I don't have a count now. I actually I really need to merge in some pull requests that's been hanging for a little. Um, the list keeps growing, right? Like people yeah. keep submitting new ones, and 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 it's very exciting. And and there's like 120, 140, something like that now. I've, I'm not even up to date with the exact count, and it, it's an interesting little project in itself. Like. Originally, it was actually built as a dynamic site that had a little database and kept using like talk to the GitHub API and so on. And and it it was actually a little hard to run because we needed to do a lot of API requests to get the most recent numbers and so on. So we had to start thinking about how to, could we cache that and do it, but without getting stale content and so on. And it was actually a, a, a real pain to, to run stackgen.com. So at a point I was really like, okay, this makes no sense. I have to actually change stackgen.com to be static, right? And I rewrote it with, with middleman. As soon as we actually had like the initial continuous deployment part of our Netlify product, I set it up with that in a way where every day Netlify will run a build of stackgen.com. During the build, middleman will will talk to GitHub's API and it will get all the latest uh, stars and forks and issues for each of the projects. And each project is just like a markdown file in our GitHub repository. So it's also very easy to contribute a new one. You just make a pull request with a new markdown file. 
and and the build process will automatically look up that repo and find the number of stars and so on. And then it uses an an interesting little little hack to keep track of the history over time. So there is actually a gist in GitHub that's like a big JSON document with all the history. And uh, every time we finish the part of a build that fetches the data from GitHub, we use the GitHub API again to push a new version of that Git with an updated history. So so there's like a big, it's like using Git as a sort of very slow database, but it doesn't need to yeah. be fast, right? Because it's just a static build. And once the whole build is done, we push it to Netlify and uh, and a new version is live. And that happens like it happens as a daily process. We trigger with a webhook. So every day we rebuild and update the stats. And every time someone makes a pull request, Netlify will actually also run a build of that pull request and give it to me on a URL so I can go in and check like does everything look right and, and then merge in the the, the, the pull request. And uh, of course it completely solved all the the issues we, we originally had around how to make the site performant or do caching or whatever of of those lookups? It's it's a zero maintenance project now, of course, right? And, yeah. and uh, has been on Hacker News and stuff like that many times without obviously without any issues. Awesome. So the static portion like really makes sense as far as like using a product like Netlify or going like the S three route and just getting like your front end yeah. to be hosted. Yeah. Um, but one thing that really got me interested in Netlify for me as a mm-hmm. user, yeah. um, my intro to JavaScript, not my intro to JavaScript, my intro to actually production level, yeah. JavaScript was Ember. Yeah. And Ember was really big on separation of concerns. So yeah. their framework actually builds properly down to an yeah. index.html. Yeah. Um, React is the same way, it's yeah. built on Node. Yeah. Um, Angular, same thing. So all yeah. these JavaScript frameworks, I'm, I just want to make a point that Jamstack doesn't stop once no. you start adding in Node. No. Um, you're able to, services like Netlify, you can host an entire React app. Do you want to explain yeah, more about absolutely. that? Absolutely. So, our, our own application at app.netlify.com, right now that's actually an Angular app, uh, but we're very soon going to release a new version of that that's an, a, a React application. And it's, of course, like app.netlify.com is hosted on netlify.com. And I mean, again, like a, a typical React app is just you use, like in our case, we use Webpack, which is more and more becoming the standard for, for all of the asset compilation pipelines. So we use Webpack to take our whole project and turn it into a bundle and a CSS file and some and an index HTML. And then we've, we've hooked that up with, with, with Netlify. So every time we push to Git, we'll just have Netlify run a build and, and deploy. And again, when many of these frameworks started out, like when Ember started out, the common way of using them was like having your Ember application inside a Rails application and things like that. And I think all of them, more or less independently, or like everybody just discovered that it's much nicer to really get a clean separation and to have one repository with with whatever tool you're using to build your backend APIs. Either backend API or different APIs if you're using a lot of different services, and one repository that's really just the front end in itself. And one of the things that's also powerful with this is that it's very easy. For example, with Netlify's application, if if you just clone the application and locally run npm install npm start, then you'll instantly just have Netlify's client side app running locally talking to our production API, right? So that makes it really easy when working on just UI components and so on that you don't even actually need a local database or anything. You can just work directly with the production data and see how it looks like and, and tweak components. Then of course if you're if you're also doing work on the API, you can just set an environment variable and 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 the app will talk to your local version of the API or whatever. But again that kind of, of decoupling makes it Makes it really easy to work on each part in, in in isolation. And one thing I'm also excited about is apart from that, like that that's something we're starting to see. And I, I spend actually my my weekend doing a little proof of concept for some of this. But where where you really start also building hybrid approaches, where you yeah. use some kind of of static build tool to build out a ton of HTML pages, but then you decorate those pages with small single page apps for for the interactive functionalities and. In our own case, we have some examples of that. Like we have, when you go to netlify.com, there's like an interactive terminal tutorial on how our CLI tool works. 
and that tutorial is is a little React application itself, and we just pull in the script for that, and and then it runs in a little part of our static site that's built with Jekyll and takes over control of that little part and gives you this interactive tutorial. And I think that I think we'll see becoming really really mainstream as well. This mixing of like statically built content-driven sites with elements that are handled by small single-page apps. Yeah, one, one really good example was the last uh, static web tech meetup that we had um, mm. here at Heavybit. And yeah. uh, David yeah. Wells, who presented the topic on his um, for CSS modules. Yeah. Yeah, so and then he also, as like a little extra sprinkle at the end of it, he showed his React uh, playground, I guess, is what he yeah. called it, yeah. and which which was a mixture of Phenomic, which is a static site generator yeah. for React, yeah. but it's also tons of React components shoved in there. Yeah. So that way, like designers and other front end developers can just go in there and play around some CSS, play around with resizing boxes, yeah. uh, which kind of blew me away. Like understanding that, oh wait, I can do this. This is yeah. simple. It's just yeah. it's a little bit of markup and a lot of bit of JavaScript. Absolutely, that's really cool. Like there's sort of two. Two static site generators that's really pursued that idea, which is like Phenomic and uh, and Gatsby. Yeah, and I know that Kyle from Gatsby now is also going to do a, a a huge push to actually take Gatsby to the next level and so on. And uh, and by the way, like if anybody out there is is listening and interested, he's very much looking for people that have projects that would benefit from one of these approaches and uh, that that would want to work with him on on. Giving sort of real use cases for Gatsby that yeah, he can just make pushing it, the project uh, yeah, forward. pushing the project forward. Yeah. And Phenomic has also really made made great strides. There's also a, a React static boilerplate and so on, but I still yeah. think like Phenomic and Gatsby are the two that are really yeah. pushing that vision. Yeah, I see a real need for a lot of this, especially documentation. So I'm only very new to the React community. Yeah. But I've been very impressed with the documentation so yeah. thus far for the community. I think Ember does a really good job as well, but not every project has good documentation. No. But the fact that you can easily just spin up a static website, host yeah. it on Netlify or S3 yeah. for yeah. super cheap, kind of lowers the barrier for yeah. the limitation. I know a lot of the Ruby projects that I used to contribute to are really ugly looking YAML files. <laughs> yeah. um, and mainly, I think, hosted with GitHub pages on yeah. the, the built in GitHub pages yeah. build tool. Yeah, GitHub, like the stuff. GitHub. Yeah, so I mean, it, it really opens up the door to the, yeah. the limitations of uh, GitHub pages, I think. I guess I'll talk a little more about that. Where it's built around Jekyll. Jekyll works really well with GitHub pages, but when yeah. you go to anything outside of that. Yeah, it's more of a pain, and, and you have to actually push. The build output to a branch in your repository, which always like, at least if you're a little bit of a purist around like version control and so on, it always feels very dirty when you have to actually push build output to your version control instead of just pushing source code. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a bit wonky, and I think a lot of people have built their businesses and projects around GitHub Pages, and I think yeah. GitHub's realized this. And yeah. uh, I think about a year ago they started throttling certain pages, yeah. which. For good reason. I mean, it wasn't it made for that that type of platform. No, no, and it's a free service that's really like meant meant to like help people host their open source project pages yeah. and documentation and so on. So of course, when people start pushing it to to run like production sites, I, I imagine that GitHub has to take some action, right? Yeah, now. yeah. Which is the beauty of Jamstack. So the whole approach and the whole the term itself is pretty yeah. agnostic of what Absolutely. your choice is. So Absolutely. if you want to use like pure static stuff that builds yeah. with Node, um, yeah. go. You can do it. Like yeah. if you like Jade over yeah. Haml or yeah. over regular HTML, you can go ahead yeah. and do that too. So I like that. Uh, I guess the difference. The only one I I haven't used Lamp Stack, but Mean Stack is the other one that yeah. is the, yeah. the the stack itself. Yeah. I know it's very specific to like Mongo, Express, yeah. Angular, and then yeah. Node. But there were so many other like I know a lot of people were trying to push the mean means like the two e mean stack, yeah. which was like <laughs> instead of Angular Ember, or you know there were like a lot of different phrases that came out yeah. like, about a year and a half ago yeah. that people were trying like oh mean stack well you'll like our our new like whatever stack, and yeah. um, I know Jamstack is not that, but the, I mean the the, the yeah. another thing from initially when when starting to talk about Jamstack was also to see that in a certain way like. The main concept for the Jamstack is that the stack has moved up a level where before it really was very much about like 
what's on our server, like it, like with the original sort of the, the whole terminology started to come with the LAMP stack, right? Like, and there was really like Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP or Python or Perl or so on, right? And it was very tied to like, this is what I'm running on my server. And of course, one of the big things that's happened is, is also this idea of no longer having a concept of my server, right? Where when people to deploy to Netlify, obviously we run a lot of servers. In like right now, we we have like twenty six different uh, the presences in twenty six different data centers, I think, and servers all over the place, right? But people that use Netlify don't think about servers, right? They they no longer work on the level of abstraction of a server. This whole concept of a serverless stack. Which of course, in one way, it doesn't make sense at all, right? Because of course, there's lots of servers. Uh, you you need servers to run your stuff, but at the term, like at the level of abstraction that the developers work on, the idea of a server goes away, and you start thinking about like this is my front end. I just push it here, and it gets distributed all over the world, and it and I don't have to think about that, and. We're starting to see this also with like the idea of Lambda or Azure Functions, so all of these Iron IO as well, right? These functions as a service or, or message queues as a service, where it's really just like I'll even just write some code and just have a function that runs somewhere when I need it, and and I stop thinking about like servers in the same way. And of course, there's a ton of servers involved in that, and it's a super complicated process. But but for the developers themselves. We are starting to see this step up, where the stack has changed to be really like in the terms of the front end, really just about markup, JavaScript, and the APIs you talk to, right? Yeah. And and the actual that level below it of like what is running on my server? Am I using Varnish or Nginx or what about my database? Is it MySQL or Mongo or whatever? Like that that level. Is out of the equation for actually working on the front end, and that's 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 really what I mean with like the stack has moved up a little. Yeah, yeah, and like well, good example. So about a about a year and a half ago, I started a Slack community with uh, some friends, yeah. and so I built what could have been a static site, but actually ended up being this like weird Express Node app. <laughs> that all I needed to do was so we had a it was a Slack community. All we had to do was send invites, yeah, and auto. Accept those invites when people submitted the form. Yeah. Uh, with Slack, it's more of a closed model, um, yeah. so you have to accept people. You can't just have like people go to a link and add your email and you're in. Yeah. So we basically wanted to get rid of that one step. Yeah. So I cr- created this Node server and this like the ex- Express form that talked to some other like software or form as a service. I forgot what it was, but anyway, regardless, not important. But they would fill out the form. I would have to have the node server running like 24 hours a day, so that way it would auto accept it, and then it would be good, good to go. So we once we started it, we had like this huge push, got a couple hundred people signing up, auto inviting, and we were good to go. But now with like things like Netlify and like with Lambda or Iron IO, yeah. I could have yeah. just had some sort of like JavaScript function that got ran yeah. asynchronously. Yeah. Every time someone filled out the form, yeah, and I would have never had to ho- run the server on my she- machine, no. had my machine crash multiple times throughout the day while <laughs> trying to do work, yeah. and I would just wouldn't have to worry about it. And I think the fact that this podcast is like in play, I, I'm really excited because now people are going to be more aware of that yeah. you could actually do this, yeah, and uh, more tools like you know Netlify, yeah, um, people can have stuff pushed, and you can have yeah. your Lambda functions running asynchronously yeah. with whatever yeah. people fill out in your forms or whatever. So yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm also very excited about seeing the whole ecosystem around this mature, right? Because of course, we it's still early days, and you can still see that a lot of the people building big projects with this are on the bleeding edge and are doing a lot of like custom development around it and so on, right? But I think we'll really and at Netlify we are working a lot to help people get to that point where you don't like need to do a lot of custom work around it, where you can really just jump in and work with this architecture and just have things work. Um, and and I think that'll be. Really exciting to follow in the in the next couple of years, like this this new way of building sites really maturing and the whole ecosystem around it growing up. Cool. Well, I really enjoyed the conversation. On that note, uh, I wanted to move into some of our jam picks. Yeah. Uh, I before shortly before the show, I asked uh, if you had a pick. Did you have one that you're jamming with? 
Yeah, that I'm jamming with. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so just because like, um, anything that you do during work or to not think about work. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing is that as a founder, <laughs> I kind of think about work all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, very true. I've been enjoying some good old like Jacob Pistorius lately. Uh, oh, probably that? the best bass player oh, okay. ever. Um, he, he had a way too short life. Got killed by a biker at 35, but he was he was like the bass player for a band called Weller Report. Um, Is this a uh, European band or no? It's an American band. It's, oh, okay. It was, they were like the the they actually like the were the best selling jazz group ever. Okay. Um, back in the in the 70s, um, with Joe Savinol and uh, Wayne Shorter as the as the group leaders, and then. Jacob Pistorius is, is an amazing, amazing character there that, that really was like changed the way the bass has been played. Um, oh wow! Like and and pretty much any big bass player today will somewhat be influenced by by the way he started playing the bass. And just completely incredible technique and a whole new sound. Um, very very original. Wow! Also very. Peculiar personality. Yeah, I think uh, for the listeners' sake, uh, Matt, you have a background of music. <laughs> yeah, I do. And uh, yeah, so you, you spend a lot of time in music. You actually, you're a classically trained musician as well. Um, yeah, not not a professional musician. I studied uh, music at the university in in Denmark. So in Denmark, the music is it, at the university is just like studying comparative literature. You're yeah. not getting an education as a musician. You're sort of learning about the the history, the theory of music, the some composition, and um, but but it's really a, a part of the humanities. And and I I had like my secondaries in comparative literature, so it was really like what I was studying was like the culture of music. What does it mean? Why do people play music? As a part of that, I also did play plas- classical piano and. Uh, I miss that now. I don't have a piano these days. So it's like in San Francisco, you need to yeah to be pretty lucky to be able to afford a place where you have room for a piano. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a luxury days. for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I even worked in Denmark as a as a musical journalist before I before I started sort of my second career in as, as a developer. Well. Awesome, super interesting. Um, I did a podcast with Matt on my other podcast, This Developing Story. Um, you should check it out. Yeah, and uh, get the whole story there. Yeah. So as far as uh, picks for me, I'll stick with the music. Um, I've been listening to a podcast called Song Exploder, um, which is on the Panoply Network, and it's super, super awesome. I, I only remember the, the host's name because it's it's an interesting name, Richie Case Sherwood. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, he basically goes through a song from a band. As a, or a musician, and basically this re-architection like breaks down why the song was made and what what sort of elements came to making the song. So they've had um, quite a different uh, big names out there that have been on the the actual like Weezer was on there for an episode, but then a lot of other small indie acts will be on there too. And I think uh, one of my first episodes was actually a rapper from LA too um, who was on there and just broke down the beats that he he. He rapped to and the music that he uh, created. So, highly recommend checking that out. Um, Matt, if people want to follow you and check you out on the internet, um, how can they? Uh, they can start by learning how to spell my second name. <laughs> um, I'm Bealman on Twitter, B I I L M A N N. I think it took me around seven years to learn how to spell it myself, but uh, hopefully others can can do better. So yeah, Bealman on on Twitter. Awesome. Well, Matt, again, thanks for the chat and continuing to spread the jam. That's all the time we have for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library. It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders. 